Um, what we're going to do now is just have a, um, I'm going to invite my panel. I've got a panel. We like panels. Can I have my panel up? So uh, Chris Wilkins, Ag Agnes Wong, Hamish Allardyce, Megan Whelan, Russell Brown and Tuari Portiki, please, to the stage. And then I'll introduce them properly when they're up here. Go on. So what I've briefed um, our panellists um, to do is to give um, a four-minute reflection from their various perspectives, and you'll see what their various perspectives will be in a minute, next minute. Um, so a four-minute kind of thing of the last three days and what are the next steps and what are we going to be doing at the, the next conference in 20 years' time. Um, so I, have, I do have a speaking order. Um, so Dr. Chris Wilkins, the man in the middle over here, is um, the senior, a senior researcher at uh, Massey University's Shaw Fariki uh, Research Centre. Chris has a long history of, uh, drug, uh, of, of drug research, researching people who, working with people who use drugs to figure out drug trends and that kind of stuff. Um, a long uh, published record of cannabis research particularly around the cannabis economy in New Zealand. So, Chris, over to you. I think... Hello? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, thanks, Ross. Um, I, I guess I had three kind of observations, and the, the first one started with uh, Wayne Hall's uh, presentation when he compared uh, the cannabis research on harms and risks in 1994 with 2013. And I think one of the things that really struck me about that was, you know, how much had changed and, and how I'm a researcher, so I, I guess the thing that came out of that for me was how long it, it took um, for research to discover all those harms and clarify all the risks related to cannabis, uh, you know, getting away from the myths. I mean, the political debate uh, is really polarised, so it's hard to know what to believe. But it was really interesting how it took a number of decades to find out about those uh, or clarify the harms and risks. <laughs> and that was interesting because I, I'm really interested in the new psychoactive substances bill and, the, and, and the, the act. And the way this regime is supposed to happen now is that somehow we're going to have this group of experts and they're going to assess these completely novel substances and keeping in mind that we had you know, hundreds of years of experience with cannabis before we were able to clarify all these things, but with new psychoactive substances, we supposedly got this regime where we're going to be able to, you know, look at all the risks before we even get them out there and then approve and not approve substances. So um, if, we can, if we contrast that with the, the, the situation with cannabis, is I think we've got to be a little bit wary about how well we're going to be able to identify risks given that it's taken so long with cannabis. Um, the second thing was, um, you know, when we're talking about uh, designing regimes, regulatory regimes for drugs, I, I really take the point that, you know, we, we can sit there as academics and people that know a lot about this subject and design this perfect regulatory regime. But we've also got to be keep in mind that we're not living in some utopian uh, world where everyone does exactly what is well informed and does exactly what... Uh, we would like them to do, we've got to look at um, the political system and the regulatory system in the real world, and um, as was pointed out, the best examples of that are alcohol and tobacco, and if you look at that, you can see the forces of the industry who mould how that, that happens and what doesn't get changed. Um, if we look at alcohol in New Zealand, how long it's taken and how small the progress is with that. And uh, finally, the, the third point that, um, that, that came out of, for me, was, um, you know, we've got to think about vulnerable people. So there's no point dividing drug policy for well-functioning middle-class people, because they're, they're, by and large, they're always going to be OK. But when we talk about bringing in new drugs and new regulation, I think the reason we've talked a lot about adolescents and youth is because they're the people that pay the bill at the end of the day. They're the vulnerable people. Um, we can't uh, get into a situation where we're designing drug policy for middle class people that are well functioning.
thanks, Chris. I'm going to hand it over to a token young person, uh, uh, Agnes Wong, who has been uh, furiously tweeting um, throughout uh, throughout the past three days. And so Twitter's a um, a thing on the internet, people. Um, <laughs> and um, there were lots of people twittering away, and um, the conference has been trending. Apparently, that's a thing in New Zealand. So Agnes is. Uh, on Auckland Council's Youth Advisory Panel. Have we got a hey machine at the microphone? There we go. Hi, Agnes. Yeah. Talking. Hello. Yeah. 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 Okay. I just before I start, I just want to say thank you to the New Zealand Drug Foundation on behalf of us young people for allowing for us to be at the conference. Um, people appear to be open-minded to the options canvassed in the debate that we had before lunch, and there was meaningful support for both sides, and this highlights that it's an issue that can be openly discussed by the wider public, including young people, without falling to the pitfalls of such a polarised debate. I have thoroughly enjoyed my past three days at this symposium. Coming from someone who has had little interaction and knowledge of cannabis, I've learned a lot and have been made well aware of the adverse effects, particularly for young people. However, my fellow young people have, with our supposedly not quite formed brains, have our own opinions for that I'd like to share. <laughs> the example of the Christchurch Youth Court is a great example of positive youth enforcement and allows for youth empowerment. I'm sure many of you would agree that why shouldn't we replicate this in other cities? If young people are caught, there are major implications for our future prospects. We feel that we have been perceived in a somewhat negative light. The research shown was highlighted has highlighted the adverse impacts and the negatives associated with young people's consumption of cannabis. But young people are also able to be rational. There's a large gap between the social perceptions and policy. The policy decisions and debates appear to be largely removed from those which cannabis affects the most and those where it seems to be, I guess, the most socially acceptable. And then there's also the perception of other drugs, such as alcohol, but then they also don't have to have the same esteem that cannabis has. To beat this supposedly young person's issue, one suggestion would be a youth-led approach. And Lani is a good example of this. When young people are empowered, they are more likely to respond and make change. When we aren't seen as a negative light, I guess young people are kind of seen as future young leaders. But in fact, we can be leaders now. So include us in the debate policy, discussions, and solutions. We are innovative, interested, and ready to empower our peers in this issue. Thanks for being able to come for the whole three days. It's a, it was a big ask, and if I was a young person, I wouldn't want to hang out here for three days. And, we, and, and to the other guys, we've, um, we, we, we've had... Um, uh, thanks to sponsorship from the Health Promotion Agency scholarships for, for 20 young uh, Aucklanders who, who have been hanging out and also volunteering for, you know, running the mics. Um, maybe next time they won't just be running the mics, we might get a few more young people up on stage. Thanks, Agnes. Um, over to my friend Hamish Allardyce, who I'm not quite sure how to introduce, but he's a friend of the Drug Foundations. He's... Um, he works for the um, New Zealand Society on Alcohol and Drug Dependence, um, uh, one of the, the major sponsors um, uh, of the symposium. But I'll let Hamish do whatever you have to do. Hi. Thanks, Ross. Has anyone noticed how um, Kevin Haig's looking more and more like Gandhi? Has anyone else noticed that? <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> and, and Steve Rawls, who looks a bit like Sean Penn. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? So we did have all the stars on the side of the stage today. Um, so thinking about it, so we, we, I think we do know more than we did 20 years ago about cannabis. So I think it's um, worthwhile to note that. And, um, and also that cannabis use is not going to stop. So what can we do? Um, well, protection of the young people and uh, seems to be key, the young and the vulnerable, not just the young is the vulnerable as well. And um, I certainly agree with Chris on, on that one. And um, for those that do fall through the cracks, you know, thinking about the drug courts, um, and the youth court is uh, 
a key thing as well. Um, regulation looks like it's the answer. Um, however, it's not likely to, um, to actually solve all of the issues. So it's so complex. It's really, it is really difficult to try and work it all out. And I, you know, the big brains who are on here, who um, you know, talked about the debate, my heart goes out to your, you and your task at hand. Um, thinking about synthetic cannabis, seems like it's full of rubbish to me. <laughs> I wouldn't want to use it. Um, um, you probably be, as smoking cannabis doesn't seem like a very good option either, so you're probably better off making it into a cake, which is what I, I used to do a lot of <laughs> many, many years ago. Um, however, you know, eventually things are going to come to a head uh, for those who develop a dependence, so it's you know, essential that we have services there to support people who do fall off the log. Um, as a recovering drug addict myself, um, being drug free for 25 years now, um, largely from the effects of cannabis and whatever else I could find at the time, more was my drug of choice. Um, I will continue to do the, the work that I do with people in a voluntary capacity and have done for 25 years. And I'll continue to do that and sort of clean up whatever you guys screw up in, the, in any way. So um, I just hope that you don't get it too wrong because um, I'd like to see not so many people coming through the door. So that's all I want to say. Thanks. Thanks, Henry. <laughs> so this is my thank you card. You didn't, you didn't fuck it up. Well done. <laughs> Weary bunch at the Drug Foundation. Um, our next panelist, stand by. I'm going to go to her Twitter profile, Megan Whelan. She's a, a senior producer and journalist for the wireless.co.nz, which is Radio New Zealand's new youthy uh, thing, online uh, 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 media outlet for that will tell, tell news to a younger audience by younger people. Um, that's not on her Twitter profile. Um, uh, so Megan is a curly hair proponent, a nerd, a beer drinker, and a marriage and civil union celebrant. Views are my own, obviously. Megan. I, I have to be a little bit careful because as the public service journalist, I'm not meant to have any views of my own, so I have to be a little bit careful. I wrote a blog post from here this morning and in the first draft of it, I said something along the lines of, uh, like most young, New youngish New Zealanders, uh, I've been, let's say, around cannabis, uh, which was the best way I could think to describe what my own experience of cannabis was. Because when I talked about coming up to this thing, uh, this conference, for some pieces that we're going to be working on in January, one of my colleagues says, the thing is, we all know people who smoke every day, and they're fine. They're maybe just a little bit slow. Uh, and we wondered if maybe there was a better way of explaining that. And I think probably what has come out of certainly the first day of this conference is that we as the media need to do a much better way of, do, thing of explaining that and certainly explaining to young people uh, what that they're a little bit slow thing means. Um, I, but having said that from this afternoon, the other thing we need to be a bit careful about is not encouraging them to uh, go out and buy everything just by the very nature of our reporting. Um, but having said that as well, I've been a reporter for the better part of a decade and I can't think that I have ever reported on cannabis until today. Um, so while I think it's something we talk about a lot and the people in this room obviously think about a lot, it's not something that is making the news media very much. And so we probably need to do a better thing. I mean, if the David Ferguson study, 80% of young people have tried it by the time they're 21, we probably should be telling them a little bit more about what they're doing. And certainly the Psychoactive Substances Bill is a really good opportunity for us to do that, and the wireless will be looking at that next uh, in January. Um, I think David Ferguson also said in his presentation yesterday that it is very difficult to have a conversation about this stuff when the views on it are so polarised. Um, and you might have noticed that the media likes two sides to a debate. Um, and it might be a little bit easier for us to have a discussion about this if 
we all tried to look at it in a slightly more nuanced way than just maybe legalization versus complete prohibition. Um, and yeah, that's what we'll be trying to do, I guess. Yeah. Oh, one other thing. The other thing maybe to do, uh, I think, that probably needs to come out of this is that young people, while they are maybe slightly vulnerable, um, aren't a homogenous group. Uh, and that's a, it's, that came out a lot yesterday, that they're not a homogenous group. Young people are not just all one kind of person. Um, lots of young people are incredibly vulnerable to this, and lots of young people are having real harms to this, but some of them are fine. Um, and it's up to us as the media probably to try and find all of those people. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Russell Brown is a well-known person about these parts. He writes um, the public address blog. He's a, been a, he's a, does TV. Um, uh, he's a long-term friend of the Drug Foundation and over the last three days has been doing some uh, interviews, filming some interviews for us and they're going up now, soon? Internet's fucked. Um, <laughs> so they'll be going up well, once we've got the internet fixed. Um, so, yes, um, Russell. Um, I've really enjoyed this. Um, I was a little surprised. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm an advocate of um, cannabis law reform. I was a little surprised to hear some other advocates um, being quite hostile to the idea of hearing about health research at a, at a cannabis and health conference. I thought that was really odd. Um, I was very interested in it. I want to understand the risks. Um, and I was particularly interested in Nadia's research because you know, the, the implications of that are quite serious. I did have some questions. What constitutes heavy use? Is it simply near daily use? Um, I was able to interview her afterwards. No, it's a bit more complicated than that. Uh, she mentioned at one point in her presentation uh, people, uh, her subject smoking at the level of around seven joints a day. Um, I come from rock and roll. I know lots of people who are near daily smokers. I don't know anyone who smokes at that level. I, I don't doubt that they exist. Interestingly, I talked to the normal people about it and they were scratching their heads as well. Uh, so when I um, had the chance to interview her, she confirmed that figure and she said that um, uh, some of her subjects uh, smoked 20 to 25 joints a day. So I think you know, we're getting some idea of, of what heavy use is. The other interesting thing that she said was that uh, they had all self-selected on the basis of newspaper ads, so they were at least able to open and read a newspaper and get themselves somewhere. And she said they all lived functional lives. Uh, some of them, some of the heavier users were actually company CEOs. Uh, and I think it's kind of interesting to uh, note the effects of comparably heavy consumption of, of other psychoactive drugs, including alcohol. Um, I think we'd find a pretty scary story there too. Um, I am familiar with the work of the Dunedin and Christchurch studies. Um, I enjoyed hearing it again. I do know the difference between relative and absolute risk. Um, one thing that came out again, which was again something I already knew, was age of onset. Um, it, I don't think we can reiterate this too often. Uh, and I've had that talk with my kids, with my two boys. Uh, and you know, I, don't, I think just say no doesn't work. And I actually said to them, look, I have no wish and I don't have the ability to manage the rest of your lives, but science says wait. And um, that seems to have worked and I think it's actually quite a useful message and maybe we could talk more about that. Um, another thing that struck me was that I don't think anyone who appeared on this stage over three days uh, gave advice in line with actual trends of cannabis enforcement, which as um, Sasha and Nori pointed out are increasingly punitive. Uh, not one speaker. Uh, even Kevin, who's a, a, a staunch prohibitionist, uh, <laughs> has acknowledged several times that, that we do need to address the harms of criminalisation. But can I ask you now, how do we address the harms of criminalisation without some form of decriminalisation? Yeah. Like the term harm reduction, decriminalization means a million things to a million different people. You don't, no one knows what it means unless it's defined. So if we say, you know, can we remove criminal sanctions for low level users, especially youth and other populations that might be penalized by that criminal record, I would say yes. 
And so I may be going against your vision of me as the staunch no, no, American I'm, prohibitionist. I'm, uh, I'm just um, but yeah, I mean, I think that's I think that's a sensible view. We don't want the consequences of the law to be worse than the actual act of itself. But that's totally not the debate that's going on in a lot of parts of the country where this thing is moving at 100 miles an hour before we can get any kind of uh, evaluation or have an actually careful, considered discussion of the pros and cons of policy. So can we refer to you as a, a decriminalization advocate? If you define it every single time with a footnote and with let that definition, we, we, can, we can talk about that. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> Another uh, really key point, which was interesting, and it's something that I, I haven't thought about in any depth before, um, which is that the key factor in resilience to harms from cannabis and other drugs lies not just in the individual, but in the community around the individual. And I talked to Steve Alsop uh, on Wednesday about that, and, and he emphasised that. He said key factors in curbing harm from cannabis were social and, as he put it, even spiritual. Uh, having a reason to get up in the morning makes a big, big difference. And, we got exactly the same message from someone who'd lived that in the form of Lani Hunt. I thought he was just fantastic. Um, he spoke from the stage really well, um, and yeah, I, I was really glad he was here. Thanks for inviting him. A um, couple more things. Um, James Dunn, loved it, thank you. Um, could you please keep speaking? Um, I appreciate it when you come and uh, clarify things on the blog for us. Um, I really enjoyed uh, listening to you there. It clarified a lot of things for me. Um, so you're an important public voice. Thank you. And one more thing. Um, I came up with a, with a synonym for marijuana that no one else did. Um, muggles, believe it or not. Yeah, yeah. Not the Harry Potter muggles, but uh, in the 1920s, a joint was referred to as a muggles, which you'll know if you read a book called Really the Blues by... Uh, a jazz mu musician called Mez Mesro, and it is a great read. Most of it's bullshit, but it's a great read. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Russell. Yeah, on, on, on all the, the cannabis synonyms, I was somewhat surprised that Jackson Wood knew a lot about pot. <laughs> Should we talk after? No. <laughs> Um, the final, final panellist is a person um, who was um, at the conference 20 years ago. Um, so he might have some interesting things to say. He will have some interesting things to say because he's my boss. Um, Tuari Portiki is chair of the uh, Drug Foundation um, and he's director of Māori Development at Otago University. Tuari. Tēnā uh, um, I don't feel clever just at the moment. So going last is a bit of a, it's a bit daunting because I get the sense that I'm meant to be clever and wise and inspirational. I don't feel any of those things just at the moment. So what I've got here is more of a collection of thoughts. So consider it a thought dump rather than anything bigger than that. But I want to speak on behalf of me rather than on behalf of the Drug Foundation or some of those other roles that I've had. Um, <clears throat> part of me and who I am is um, I'm a recovering drug addict and alcoholic and this coming Sunday will be 24 years since I uh, gave up using alcohol and drugs. Um, so during that time I did smoke a bit of dope and I mainly did it because it felt good. I'm sure there were all sorts of other underlying psychological reasons, anxiety, to fit in, social, whatever, but at the time, it felt good. Later on, as I progressed to opiate use, um, I used to smoke dope to bring on the opiates, including methadone. Um, and interestingly, a few years ago, I was talking to a well-known expert in addiction who told me that was wrong. <laughs> I said I used to have my method out in the morning and in the afternoon I'd have a couple of joints and it would bring it on. He said, no, no, it doesn't. Um, which to me is part of the issue. It's part of the whole problem. So it has been a great conference as far as having a range of people here goes. So I just want to comment on a couple of things. Like I say, random thought dump. I really enjoyed uh, uh, all of the presentations, but I particularly want to mention Polder and the way he kicked it off on uh, Wednesday <clears throat> when he talked about a Māori worldview. And I think... For me, 
that was incredibly profound because just for a minute, I think people started to get a glimpse of just what that looks like and how far away that is from what we do and what we've been doing. Kylie then spoke um, yesterday about, brought on that justice perspective and, and highlighted the stats that we're all really familiar with and brought in a treaty argument mm -hmm. into how Māori are dealt with by the criminal justice system around um, cannabis use. Fraser was interesting. I mean, he, um, I've, he asked some questions about current thinking and also the current sort of regime or the, the sector and whether or not it, my take out from it was whether or not it was part of the problem or part of the solution. But I um, salute the fact that he was courageous enough to put that view out there. I was at the conference 20 years ago and um, it seems to me now that the debate is more sophisticated but essentially the same. Fundamentally there's still an issue about the need for cannabis and cannabis use to be uh, seen as a health issue rather than anything else. Experts here have brought a wealth of informed, considered and evidence-based information to the conference. I think that my sense is that there's a higher risk that nothing will change because to me the views are still fairly polarised and that will, the risk is it will stay stuck. The chair of the Drug Foundation in his inspirational opening speech on Wednesday morning <laughs> mentioned um, that each year 1,500 young people are convicted. That's just young people, that's, that's not counting all the others. So in the 20 years since our last one of these, 30,000 of our young people have been convicted. They now have criminal convictions for cannabis. We've heard from experts from the UK, from the US, from Australia, with all due respect, from an indigenous or a cultural perspective, none of your countries have a track record that gives me confidence that you have the solutions to our problems. And what I wonder is maybe, maybe it's time to get our whānau more centrally involved in creating solutions to the problems that our whānau, our families are facing. I was also taken by um, Lani and Rio, and um, a part of me thinks we should just give lots of resource and money to Lani and to the young people who are here um, to come back with their ideas about what's going to make a difference. So I agree that it's fantastic to have the younger people here, but I too would like to see next time um, you guys on stage telling us um, what we need to be doing and what's going to make a difference in your life. So, kia ora. I went off on a bit of a tangent and started to think about all those statistics about the number of Māori who are getting into trouble with, with cannabis and the 30,000 young people who have been convicted in 20 years. And I was wondering where the outrage had gone. Should, I, I was sitting there thinking I should be outraged. And then I started to think maybe it's because I'm getting older. <laughs> Um, maybe it's because I've been seduced by the middle class Māori that I've become, by, by that being middle class. Um, maybe it's because in fora and conferences such as this, we're uh, often led by the head <laughs> rather than from a bit lower down where our passion sits. And then I thought, well, maybe it's just that we collectively have taken on the characteristics of the substance that we're here to discuss <laughs> so we're all quite happy just to sit in here and chill and then eat occasionally. <laughs> from a whānau, from a family perspective, what I know is simply that when cannabis and cannabis use and issues are treated as a legal problem or a legal issue, it means that my whānau go to court more. When it's tra treated as a political issue, other than more votes for the Green Party, <laughs> doesn't seem to result in much else. However, cannabis and cannabis use being treated as a health issue means to me that it's about well-being, it's about family, whānau well-being, and um, 
that is something I can do something about. So ultimately, I think um, I'd like to see us coming up with ways to support our whānau, our families, uh, to deal with their own issues and their own solutions, uh, their own problems uh, within those families. So sorry about the ramble, but um, it's been an interesting um, time just trying to synthesise everything. And I think for me, there's a whole lot of issues. Um, I'm not sure that they've got any easier over the last 20 years, um, but it's great that we're all here to talk about them. Kia ora. Kia ora.